Hello and welcome to Tata Literature Live, the Mumbai International Lit Fest, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects and powered by Godrej. This session is presented by Prime Securities. There will be a short Q&A at the end of the session, so please do send in your questions in the comment section of the platform that you are viewing from. William Clay Ford Jr. has said, and I quote, creating a strong business and building a better world are not conflicting goals. They are both essential ingredients for long-term success. Can corporate social responsibility sustainably build the community and give back to society while looking beyond company profits? Our panel today weighs in. Harsh Mariwala is the founder and chairman of Mariko, a Fortune India 500 company. He is the winner of the prestigious EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award for 2020 for India. Mr. Mariwala recently published his first book, Harsh Realities, which has been co-authored by management guru Ram Charan. Harsh Realities, which has received rave reviews from readers, is a personal and captivating journey of discovering purpose and making a difference while building a world-class company. Invest in people. That is the author, entrepreneur, Sorry. businessman, and political commentator, Peter Casey's Business Mantra. Peter Casey is the founder and executive chairman of Clada Resources, a global recruiting and search business. In his recent book, The Story of Tata, Mr. Casey looks at the Tata group through the filters of working for the good of society while staying profitable and being a good employer. Chairing the discussion is award-winning journalist and author, Minnie Menon, who is the co-founder and editor of Live History India, a digital platform focused on India's rich and varied history. She has worked with some of the leading news networks in India and is the author of Riding the Wave, a book on the history of Indian business. And now, what it takes to give. Over to our panelists. Thanks so much for that introduction, Jillian, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody. It's wonderful to be here with Mr. Mariwala and Peter. I must tell you that uh, 22 years ago, when I started journalism uh, and started covering corporate India, the, the conversation about giving was really limited to uh, industrial hubs, factory towns, where a lot of uh, great work was being done uh, by industrialists and companies to kind of nurture the community around their, their areas. Uh, going forward, it became something that was taken forward by the wives, the mothers, the sisters, the women of the family who actually nurtured uh, much of these initiatives. But I must say that in the last 10 years, uh, there's been such a sea change in the way uh, the idea of giving has evolved in India. And I think a lot, lot of that is thanks to a new wave of entrepreneurs, technocrats who've come up, who've come up the hard way and realize that uh, in a country like India, it is so important to give. In fact, I must say that this is a wonderful time to talk about this because you have two Indias, really. I know Virdas has kind of done a whole piece on the two Indias, but for me, the two Indias is really the blockbuster IPOs, not the last one, of course, but the otherwise blockbuster IPOs, India, the stock markets on a roll, India, the wealthy becoming a wealthier, wealthier India. And on the other, we had 230 million people go behind or fall below the poverty line over the last year because of the pandemic. Those are the two Indias. And any company looking at growth in India has to be conscious of that because at some point you will be up against this very, very stark reality of India that to grow, you have to nurture. So it's wonderful to uh, be uh, a part of this discussion. Uh, I've known Mr. Mariwala for many years. Harsh Realities is a wonderful book. I really uh, would recommend it. And of course, Peter has done fabulous work on the Tatas. And the Tatas have been beacons uh, as far as the giving back is concerned. So it's wonderful to have these two uh, perspectives in this conversation. But Mr. Bariwala, let me start with you. As I said, and we will delve a little deeper into that over a period of, uh, or, uh, during the course of this conversation. But as I said, what is interesting is how the concept of giving has changed, not just as giving as handouts, but as facilitating real change. From your perspective, how do you see uh, the idea of give back uh, and how it has evolved for you yourself? Uh, 
Mr. Mariwal, I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sorry. So thank you, Winnie, for inviting me to this session. And to me, giving has to come from within. Uh, of course, the new statue has come in where 2% of the corporate profits are to be given uh, towards causes, charitable causes. But many organizations, many companies are taking it almost very like, like a contractually. To me, giving is actually, it means active giving, where uh, the senior person, in my case, myself, uh, has a separate team monitoring what to give, how to give, and how impactful it is. And uh, I want us to spend time in giving and not just make a cut a check to be given to some hospital or some fund. Uh, so I think that's where it's very, very crucial that corporates <laughs> take it seriously and add value in areas where they're good at. And that's what I started doing. Of course, making it compulsory means that there are more funds. Um, but I differentiating between donation and active giving. And once I happened to meet Azim Premji at a party and I asked him, I mean, what is your learning out of giving? And his first answer was, Arsh, it's easier to make money than give money. And that really, I mean, just, uh, just opened up my eyes and I started thinking, you know, why is he saying like that? And then I, as I started reflecting, I realized that uh, one has gone through an experience curve, what caused to back. How do you differentiate yourself compared to some other corporates? Are you able to add value? You must, and this is very important, you must involve your own employees in giving because they feel good when they are able to contribute something in terms of an effort. It's not financial giving. And finally, how effective is giving in terms of its impact? So I also have gone through some degree of uh, learning curve over a period of time, though we started giving much before the statute come in. And uh, I think the key thing is to be focused and do something where you can add value. That's interesting. And there are many uh, uh, corollary questions to that. But let me get Peter into the conversation. Peter, uh, important to have a bit of a history lesson because uh, we were doing a documentary film on the on communities, business communities in India. And I remember talking to Firoza Godrich, who said Jamshiji Tata kind of was set the, set the tone, set a level of aspiration for a lot of families to see what they could do and get inspired by him, of course. Uh, and you've done a lot of work on the Tatas. Now, let's go back in history and talk about Jamshedji Tata and how that was ingrained uh, within the framework of the Tatas across this huge conglomerate. What uh, did you take away when you started working on this project? <clears throat> so I started studying Tata to try and help my consultants understand more about the company, you say. And then I realized, uh, you know, the history of Tata and the more I got into it, the more I just became inspired by it. You know, so, you know, Jamshetja uh, obviously was very much, uh, you know, involved in his Farsi religion. And the Farsi religion is uh, what comes from the people who must go, should go back to the people. And, you know, he traveled a lot. And so when he was traveling, he realized through Europe, you know, the industrial revolution was going on. And he, he said that, you know, iron is the new gold, you know, and he was, he attended a, a lecture by Carlisle and he came away with this belief that if India was to get into the industrial revolution, they had to uh, have a steel company. And he'd seen the pollution uh, in your, in, you know, in the industrial cities in UK and he believed that we had to have clean energy which can you imagine he's so far ahead of his time so that's what his belief was we needed a hydroelectric dam to have clean energy to power the steel company and he thought well we also need to have a university to educate people to run these industries uh, and then on top of that he said well if people won't come to India they don't have a nice place to stay so that his other vision was uh, the Taj Mahal build a beautiful hotel but you know he gave away half his wealth uh, to set up the Institute of Science and Technology in Bangalore and he pledged half his wealth and it, it, his was a very you know way ahead of its time this is way before Carnegie started you know giving away his money to set up libraries um, so he, he uh, was you know he was so far ahead now the other half of his money he pledged to his two sons Darabja and Ratanji and of course neither of them had children so their wealth then went into the philanthropic trust so in a way you know the, the amazing business model which is so unique which is Tata 
was, you know, it, it, if they'd both been Irish, uh, Ratanji and Darabja, they had 10 children each, they, as, as is quite common in Ireland, you know, I'm one of nine. <laughs> uh, the, the wonderful story of Tata would not have happened, you know. Uh, so now, of course, the unique thing about Tata, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic to have uh, amazing philanthropists like Harsh and like Azim, you know, and like the Burles. Um, but, you know, they uh, have sort of, I think, I would like to think, and I'm sure they'll probably admit that they were, they were influenced by the, the whole Tata philanthropy uh, model, you know. And, but it is such an unusual model. They, you know, uh, Harris has done an amazing job of building an amazing company uh, and has now started to give away uh, and pledge his money just the way Ajim Prija, uh, Premji has, you know. And I was fortunate. You know, so I mean, that's it's it's just a it's such a unique business model, and very 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 few people realize that you know that when you buy a Jaguar, you're indirectly contributing to charity. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a it's a nice. Uh, it's that, an that's, model. that's wonderful way of looking at it, and that's you know a, a very important perspective, right? I mean, because I think uh, the fact that. Uh, it's not a family-run business, though it's called Tata Sons, and the fact that the Tata Trusts get the bulk of the profits of uh, the Tata Group companies is also an um, uh, 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 iteration of the man's vision. But Mr. Maribara, let me come back to you. So th the reason I brought in a quick lesson in history was because uh, to establish that I think a lot of the founding fathers of industry, of, of people, realized that in India, if you have to grow, you have to nurture the community, the society, and you have to have a very big, um, uh, you know, give back agenda to be able to succeed. Because your success is only as good as the success of the country. And I must read um, a quote from Jamshedji Tata, which I found in the Tata Trust website. Uh, and it's a very telling uh, take on how he saw uh, giving back. And I think uh, I have... Uh, an addition to that with, with a question for you, Mr. Mariwala. He says, what advances a nation or a community is not so much to prop up its weakest and most helpless members, but to lift up the best and most gifted so as to make them the great, make them the greatest service to the country. So what essentially he's saying is identify people who are bright, ideas which are bright, because they can have the maximum impact in the country. It, it brings me back to what the Marico Innovation Foundation does, Mr. Mariwala, because isn't that at the heart of what you're doing too? The fact that innovation uh, could be a real game changer by, by facilitating entrepreneurship, you are actually facilitating change. So many, right? That's one of the legs of our uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. Uh, so the three legs, one is uh, farming, Another is uh, innovation and third is education. And uh, in terms of the money spent, it's least on innovation, but a lot of effort goes into it. There are about five, six individuals in the team who are full time looking at uh, fueling innovation within the country. So we do research studies, we help organizations scale up, we also identify innovative organizations and many other initiatives we take to actually innovation, make innovation happen. We have innovation award function, which is rated very highly by the audience. Uh, so that's something which I spend a lot of time on. And as I said, there are multiple projects within innovation uh, which we pursue. Uh, we have helped the organization scale up substantially. One or two of them become uniform, unicorns because of our inputs in sales and marketing. A company like Atomberg has already become a unicorn. We've been associated with them for the last four or five years. And we also involve our employees to help them. So, you know, it's a situation where the employees feel good if, they, if they've if they been able to add value. But I think uh, we also do other things. As I said, farming is a very big, uh, we are biggest raw material is, is oil seeds and oils, which is, and oats. So farming is very critical. And I think it's important that we improve a lot of farmers. And we work a lot with coconut farmers in South uh, in helping them improve their productivity and directly buying from them. And we've seen amazing results. We've seen about 15 percent increase in productivity by better farming practices. Uh, and the rate at which we are going, we have already covered about 60,000 farmers. We expect to cover uh, much more. And within a year or two, we expect at least 100 to 200 crores extra income in the farmers' hands. And I think that's great because it is a win-win situation. If the crop is increases, we also benefit. 
And I strongly believe that, uh, you know, serving the society, whether innovation or whether it's farming or education. And as Peter was saying, you know, buying a Jaguar, you don't know you're contributing. So for one of our brands, we contribute a certain percentage of our profits uh, and that money is put in education. So there is a very strong feel good factor and I think it's demanded by all the stakeholders. So when a new employee is joining in most, the first question amongst the millennials is that, what is the purpose of the organization? And if you have a strong track record in that, it really helps. And similarly for all the stakeholders, whether it's a board, so they want a responsible corporate citizen, which is just not spending money. Are you creating an impact? Are you doing something unique? And if you're doing so, and if you if your image improves, it benefits you because of ability to attract talent, retain talent, uh, ability to attract board of directors, and overall uh, image in, in society. Peter, you know, there used to be a concept of the triple bottom line, help the revenues, the community and environment. Uh, Mr. Mariwala raised an interesting point where he said the youngsters who are joining the companies, the boards who are sitting uh, atop companies, they all want to see the impact that you are having. Is the, is the conversation around what constitutes success changing as far as companies are concerned? And you see that across uh, across in Ireland when you're where you're sitting in the UK in India is that an, a conversation that is that's increasingly happening I think you've raised a good point I mean I, I I think the reason when people join companies they look at the company and say you know what sort of company is it is it an ethical company is it is it doing good you know I mean I think ethics has now become you know such a major part of business and uh, like the Tata Code of Conduct and Ethics, which has to be signed by every employee, is a, you know, it, in TCS, it was, you know, Rattan sort of wrote that down and uh, every, he, he mapped out the ethical standards that has to be adhered to. And I think that, you know, the reason that Tata's market cap is greater than Accenture's, even though their revenues are much, are, are smaller than Accenture's, is because they're regarded as a safe pair of hands. And I, I think the, the whole standard of ethics in India has really dramatically improved. The, the, the corruption that used to be there 25 years ago is no longer prevalent as it used to be. You know, and I, I think it's wonderful that this has happened. And uh, you know, it's, it's just there's a, a, a feel good factor now. I think ethics is well, the key. You know, I, I've got uh, a lot of people asking me, you know, what makes Tata different? And, you know, what makes them special, I think, is, is just this commitment to ethics and the commitment to doing the right thing. You know, and Ratan, I had a discussion with him one time about Karl Marx, because uh, Jamshetcha was, uh, Jamshetcha was actually uh, talking, you know, uh, he was doing his, um, when Karl Marx was around. And what happened was, uh, uh, Ratan came out with a wonderful quote. He said, Marx's vision was to take from the rich to feed the poor, and Jim Setch's vision was to make the poor rich. <laughs> you know? And so it was a, a lovely quote that I found, and uh, you know, and I think that that's the essence of it. And I think giving back now is such an important part, and it's making such a difference to the lives of the people in India. Uh, these wonderful philanthropic uh, uh, people like Harsh and you know like uh, El Premji and all uh, all these people that are sort of giving back and changing the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It, it really is just it's such a good feel factor in India. I, and I, quite frankly, you don't get that in Ireland. <laughs> we, we, we're not as uh, philanthropic in Ireland, I'm afraid, unfortunately. You know, we, we should introduce a, a CSC tax in Ireland, you know, force them to give. <laughs> right, yeah. and I think that happens in the US. A lot of people are forced to give because of the inheritance tax. But uh, Mr. Mariwala, you know, I do want to uh, talk about the legislation that came in 2013, which mandated a certain portion of profits uh, of certain size companies uh, to CSR. It was resisted in quarters, but you yes. know, about seven years after that started, what do you think is the, uh, the, the verdict on it? Was it a good thing to do? Has it forced companies to get more organized? What is your sense? So I saw, first of all, there was a big realization amongst corporates that uh, the government is keen that they play this role in giving something back to the society. So that initial uh, 
step which the government had taken was to make it voluntary. Uh, and I think that was good. Uh, and then it became mandatory about two years back. Um, I thought it was required to bring in that awareness and leave it to the corporates rather than making it uh, mandatory. Um, because, you know, many times some organizations may be able to find out ways to uh, overcome that. So ultimately, as I said earlier, it has to come from within, you know, then only you will pay that much extra attention in terms of what cause you want to back, how you want to impact the society. Uh, so I think there's a larger need for corporates to realize that it is very important that the society is a key stakeholder in your journey and all the stakeholders, whether it's your own employees, your associates, uh, the shareholders uh, are all interconnected. And if you if you omit one part of that stakeholder, then it can impact you negatively. So I think that's to me is a larger issue. But I just want to differentiate one more thing, which uh, many I have not talked about. We've talked about corporate social responsibility, but a lot of, uh, at least amongst big families, a lot of giving takes place from the personal end. For example, I I spend a lot of time and money and effort in two causes which I'm backing, and uh, my daughter spends a lot of time in in handling that. So we have full fledged uh, team to manage the mental health uh, initiative which is called Mariwala Health Initiative. And uh, it's a grant making advocacy and capacity building, working only on the issue of mental health. And we truly underestimate what the ne negative impact of mental health is. And I, I strongly feel that the government and other stakeholders need to support this much more than it has been. We saw that in the pandemic, this whole issue of mental health just got accelerated multiplier times. And I think that Mm -hmm. brought it to the root that the stress anxiety is needs to be proactively handled. People should not get scared of speaking out. So we have partnered with 27 NGOs across India and basically looking at communities such as rural communities, victims of violence, the homeless, LGBTQ community, youth, farmers, and we also do capacity building in the area of mental health professionals. So I strongly feel that there should be many more funders to this is a cause which uh, has been, um, there's not enough people who are uh, spending on this as against a cause like education, which is also equally important. I'm not saying no, we also are doing that education part as a part of CSR, but this is one, uh, one area where I strongly believe that this needs much more attention uh, and it's a huge problem and we are underestimating the negative impact of mental health issues. Right, that's an important point, Mr. Mariwala, because you know, it brings me to a question. India has a lot of problems. The government can't possibly solve all of it. And I think it's wonderful that people like you, organization like the Tatas, companies, large companies are pitching in to make real impact. You know, and I think that's the most heartening thing that's happened over the last couple of years. I personally know so many people at the individual capacity or the family capacity or, or the co company capacity who are supporting causes. But I often have this question to ask. Uh, no matter how rich you are in India, you're going to be out of money to deal with the real size of the problem, Mr. Mariwala. Because you know you can have uh, 1,000 crores, 2,000 crores, 3,000 crores, 50,000 crores, but the, you will not be able to solve the problem because the problems are so huge. How do you reconcile the fact that uh, no matter how much money you put, it's going to be an uphill task? How do you gauge what the you know, measures are of success and how can you ensure that the that the work that you are doing carries on? So I think the key thing is to bring in awareness about the need to back a certain cause which you are passionate about. And don't expect that everything you will do, you will be able to resolve the issue. But whatever impact you can make, you should do it. And also expect that other funders would take it seriously. You also need to rope in the government because government also can spend the resources. So if you have a collective um, viewpoint that you know it needs many funders, it needs awareness, it needs some government backing, not only financially but in terms of uh, some legislations. So when you do that, then you start making a bigger impact. And in our case also, we went through a learning curve initially when we started. We started working with four or five organizations and now we are working with 28 organizations. 
and the one recent initiative you just started was suicide prevention uh, study because the number of suicides have increased dramatically during the pandemic you know it has been the highest suicide in a, for a long long period of time and this issue is so hurting you know that when you lose a family member it's something which is uh, i mean needs to be addressed very very seriously so i think it's a collective effort of the society corporates and whoever is passionate about this to take this issue very very seriously and back the right organizations you can't do everything on your own there are many organizations we need support uh, which need help and if anyone of the listeners is keen you may visit our website it's uh, mariwala health initiative uh, so if you visit that you'll know what what are the options available for you to back but i strongly feel that this is one need which is very badly required and i don't see any other corporate backing it in a big big way peter you studied uh, the evolution of how the tata group has seen philanthropy uh, from uh, Jamshedji's time, you made a very good point that while Jamshedji gets all the credit, uh, Sir Dorab and Sir Ratan don't get the credit, but they've also done some fabulous work. But I do want to know how, in your own mind, the the mandate has changed, the idea has evolved. Because if I'm not mistaken, 2015, there was a lot of internal thinking and Tata Trust decided that they would want to look at acting as facilitators also to kind of, uh, you know, develop the the community and the ecosystem uh, for change. So how do you see the evolution? Because it is India's largest conglomerate. So it's in, it'll be interesting to see how it has evolved in its thinking. Well, it hasn't really changed that much in as much that, you know, yes, Rattan has redefined uh, how the trusts give their donations and they're getting now involved in much longer term type projects. Whereas previously they would have been involved in sort of giving helping assistance for smaller projects are now getting much more involved in much bigger and longer term projects. Um, you know, it is such a unique company. There is no other company in the world that has got all these companies that are controlled essentially by Tata Sons, who, which is major shareholder, is the Tata Trust. <laughs> so, you know, it is actually probably the biggest charity in the world. Uh, and I think that's probably why the ethics are such a big, big part of life at Tata. You know, I mean, if you look in America, we've had Enron, we've had Bernie Madoff, we've had, you know, then you've got the Volkswagen scandal, you, you know, you've got the banks were all fined billions of dollars for unethical behavior, you know, and it's just so refreshing to have a charity controlling such a large uh, operation which gives back to society and I mean it's absolutely wonderful the uh, living way giving uh, that has been uh, you know Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett I think that's just an amazing but it's a different model it's people who've made a lot of money giving it away which is great absolutely absolutely fantastic but mm -hmm. the Tata is unique in as much that they actually have all these operating companies controlled by the philanthropic trust you know uh, and controlled by, by Tata Sons which is according to the trust. So it's a, it is, there is no other business model. I haven't come across one <laughs> like Tata, uh, and it, it's got a really good feel factor. Right. Peter, I'm going to quote from your book because I found it interesting when you kind of compared uh, Andrew Carnegie with Jamshedji Tata and the different perspectives on giving. And I didn't actually put it put the two and two together, but I do see a pattern out there because to quote Peter, he said that different, there are of course different views on giving back. Uh, and a lot of what we see with Bill and Melinda Gates or Warren Buffett is inspired by Andrew Carnegie's gospel of wealth, which uh, says that the duty of a man of wealth was to live modestly, set an example, and take care of those dependent on him, and use a surplus in a trust to benefit the community. If the wealthy did their duty, we would have an ideal state with a surplus of a few uh, wealthy people going to the betterment of the many. And now, this is at the or Peter of any give back. Why do you think the Jamshedji example is different from this? And what was the Indian way that you said was perhaps best, I mean, or the Tata way which was best suited for the Indian predicament? So um, Pernigi was an incredibly successful businessman and incredibly ruthless, you know, I mean, he was absolutely ruthless you know? and then I think he had a sort of an enlightenment you know uh, and he, he sort of realized that 
you know, he, I mean, he really was a strike breaker. He was like, he was ruthless, but he then realized that there was more to life. And I think when he got towards, he could see the end of his mortal's coil. You know, He then started being incredibly uh, philanthropic and that inspired a lot of other people. But Jim Shetchi started off, you know, as a philanthropic, as philanthropic, you know, and, and the whole, what comes from the people should go back to the people, you know, so it's a, but, you know, as I say, it's a different, uh, it's absolutely wonderful that we've got these uh, incredible uh, philanthropists now making a real change in society. Uh, I mean, one of the ones that I, and this is quite a little a funny aside, you know, uh, Rattan, when he was at Cornell, he, he was actually, he met a person who I might have called Chuck Finney. Chuck uh, uh, went on to found uh, the wholesale um, liquor distribution distribution chains at airports and then he founded uh, General Atlantic Partners and he made eight billion and he gave it all away and there's a book written by him and it's fascinating anybody who's interested in philanthropy should read it it's called The Billionaire Who Gave It All Away and he quietly went around uh, and he gave away about four billion to Ireland actually because he was Irish but he actually did it. he had a little uh, sandwich run at uh, Cornell and Rattan used to say, you know, you'd wait for Chuck to come around because his sandwiches were absolutely the best. <laughs> so, so I think uh, entrepreneurs and, you know, and philanthropy go hand in hand. And uh, I think that that really influenced Rattan a lot when he saw the American, uh, you know, philanthropy. And, you know, so that, that's a, it's such an interesting uh, it is interesting because you know, uh, Mr. Marival, it comes back to the giving pledge that a lot of people have given, and I always find uh, entrepreneurs are um, always more humble because they know that uh, you know uh, all the success is very hard earned, hard worked, and you know it's it's not something that's come in a flatter. But they're also very giving. We ourselves have been beneficiaries of uh, of the Azim Premji led, um, you know, IPSL, for instance, fabulous work they're doing supporting independent media and the work that people like us are doing in uh, mapping Indian history, you know, fighting against the the fake uh, news, etc. But uh, do you think entrepreneurs, by and large, are more giving? Do you see the difference when you talk to um, uh, people like that, because even the giving pledge, you have Nandan and Rohini Nilkani doing that, Azim Premji doing that. We have a bunch of people who are who are self-made people who are who are driving this change as well. So uh, yes, uh, entrepreneurs are giving more than corporates in terms of because at some stage in your life, you know, once you made it all, you know, they say the first 25 years is for learning. The next 25 years are for earning. And the next 25 years are for giving, you know, because at some stage in life you start finding out what, how you should keep yourself occupied. Uh, you achieved all the, all the, uh, all the excitement of building a business, and at that time you don't know what to do with the wealth. And I think that giving gives you a lot of satisfaction, but how you give is very, very critical. And I am not a believer in cutting a check and donating money to a school or a hospital, it's better to look at a cause and can you play a catalytic role in making this happen, you know? Uh, so I think that's how I look at it in terms of your question, whether are there enough entrepreneurs doing it? Uh, the older age entrepreneurs are doing it more. The new age are a bit young currently and they are still in, in the process of building their own wealth. But I'm sure it, it will over a period of time this will accelerate um, and uh, initiatives like the pledge and all will actually make people think that beyond a certain wealth can what will I do with all that wealth and uh, and it's it's good to create giving mechanisms one thing which may be impacting many families would be that you know okay if I give away then what will happen to me uh, in terms of controlling the company and things like that but that also can be addressed through investing uh, or take, you know, giving your shares to, to charitable trusts, which would remain to be a part of the company in terms of ownership. You know? But all in all, it's increasing, but I still think that we have a long way to go in terms of entrepreneur, uh, looking at it far more seriously. What do I do think also when I uh, interact with a lot of uh, uh, people who are actively part of philanthropy is also the capacity building that is happening side by side. 
a lot of you, I mean, I'll, I'll take the example of an Amit Chandra uh, from AT Chandra or Bain Capital, who, who's leading a lot of these initiatives. Ronnie Screwwala, my form, former boss, who's running space, for instance. They've brought up meticulous execution, planning, strategy, uh, ROI, return, all of that into making change happen. You know, normally uh, NGOs were not able to drive large, um, large changes because of the constraints that they face. But this uh, business precision that has come in, I think has really made it far more targeted, far more organized and far more impactful. Do you think that's true, uh, Ms. Mariwala? And, and should more of this be kind of, you should have case studies of this so that all of this could be replicated? You're absolutely right. That's exactly what I was talking about in terms of your active giving. You know, you need to be actively involved. You need to find out ways. How do you make it more effectively? So you need to spend time with the team. If you're supporting some organizations in the area of mental health, I have one month, every month I have a meeting and, you know, take them through their issues. What is impacting them? Can I help them? How do I measure their impact? So this is something which which active in giving would involve in terms of you know addressing that issue and making a very strong catalytic impact in in making them perform. Right, right. Let me take some questions from the audience now. Peter, the first question comes to you. Has the pandemic changed the focus of philanthropy in the corporate sector? Uh, if companies are laying off on one hand, how can they do philanthropic work on the other? Sakshi has asked this question on Facebook. A very pertinent question, I must add. Uh, thank you, Sachi, for your, your question. Well, yeah, I, I think that the approach that, for example, Tata has taken to the pandemic is that every single employee got paid, you know, uh, and, you know, so that that was, you know, and they gave up, uh, they, uh, they allowed the hotels to be used for the first responders. And I think the way that companies handle the pandemic is a very good way that you can judge uh, the uh, caliber of the company. Uh, and so, you know, some of the companies have handled it wonderfully well and really looked after their employees and some others have not handled it so well. So the pandemic really was a, you know, there's a saying, uh, a low tide, uh, a high tide raises all boats. You know, <laughs> So you can see uh, who's been really philanthropic and who's been giving and by the way that they handled and the way that they managed their response to the pandemic. So, uh, yeah. I hope that answers your question, Sachin. Right. There's a question for you, Mr. Mariwala. Why are there not more educational institutions in India endowed by business? In the US, uh, there's so many world-class universities. Why has India not been able to do that? Uh, of course, we have universities themselves which are coming up, which are uh, funded by corporate uh, trusts. Uh, you have the Azam Premji Foundation, you have the uh, OP Jindal, um, you have Ashoka University, fabulous example of how people have come up together. Uh, you know, a lot of technocrats, individuals have come together to support entrepreneurs included, to support liberal arts education in India. But Mr. Maribala, a lot of the endowments that are being, do being done are being done in foreign universities. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be done in higher education in India. How do you see it? So I agree with you. I, I don't know many Indian uh, industrialists have given endowments in in other countries uh, because they have passed out from that particular school. But I strongly believe that the need for giving in the area of education is much more in India. So my personal appeal to all the philanthropists is that please look at India and support Indian causes in the area of whatever you do and more so in education. Uh, but I must say that uh, at a corporate level, there are many corporates which are backing education, whether it is Premji's or whether it is Shivanadar or there's Mittal or Bharti. So there is a lot of effort is going in. And uh, as I said, I'm not, uh, I mean, if I had to spend money on education, I would spend money on how to improve effectiveness of teachers rather than putting up a school because that will require much more. And now with technology, you know, you can overcome a lot of our big challenges in uh, education, healthcare, agriculture by being virtual. So why do you need to create so many schools which is so capital intensive? Can you find out some alternative means of addressing these issues through technological routes? Right. Uh, Mr. Maribal, there's another question for you. Uh, 
what triggered your or Marico's interest in mental health, which is an unusual cause for a corporate. Pra Prajakta has asked this in, on Instagram. First, let me say that this is not corporate. This is my personal funding. It's not corporate. It arises from my passion for preventive health. And uh, before uh, we decided to uh, to invest or to, to support mental health, I did a lot of outside in. I met a lot of uh, professionals. My daughter is also very passionate about this subject. So after meeting all these individuals, I realized that there is indeed a big gap in this area. And there is a pioneering opportunity for us to do some stellar work. So it is just not giving, you know, we do a lot of research, advocacy, uh, like suicide prevention work, and many new initiatives which are getting a lot of traction now. The whole thing is getting into a moment, which which was our only not So if I'm able to appeal to many other corporates or many other individuals to support this, then this badly needed or this underinvested uh, need, uh, we will make a much rapid progress. So. I think basically a passion in investing something because if you invest in this, then I mean a lot of mental health issues can be overcome by just properly counseling, by having the right uh, right talent to support all this. And I think that's what. And again, I like pioneering newer initiatives, so it it fitted in from that point of view that I I can pioneer something which uh, has been neglected by others. Right. Um, there's a question for both of you, and I want to start with Peter. Peter, the question is from Shazia, uh, who's uh, written to us and is watching us on YouTube. Uh, she says, uh, she asks, how long does it take to build a sustainable community through philanthropy? Do you believe that this is a topic that should be introduced in educational institutions? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it should be. Uh, I mean, nobody ever, uh, when I went to university, there was never any talk about the importance of philanthropy and the importance of giving back. So I think it does start and it should start at the university level when you're teaching students and just, you know, help them understand the importance of giving back. I mentioned Chuck Feeney there who he anonym, anonym, anonymously gave away a billion to universities uh, around Ireland and the UK, uh, US. And the condition of getting the money was that you couldn't uh, you you if you you wouldn't allowed to say where the money came from, <laughs> so and I, I think that you know th there's a lot of universities in Ireland that are now you know so much better off because of his generosity. But you know I I do think we should incorporate philanthropy as part of the university programs. Yeah, absolutely. Right, Mr. Marivala. So I see a very positive trend among students who are passing out of management schools and postgraduate schools. And uh, I think the key thing is what is the organization doing in the area of not only philanthropy, but what is known as ESG these days, environment, society and governance. And there is a strong need now to, I think the time has come for us to make this a part of curriculum because there is a very high need from the students that this has this, this is a huge need uh, which the corporates can, can uh, play their role in, whether it is environmental issues or governance issues or societal issues. So if it is handled as a part of curriculum, most welcome. Right. Well, I'll, we'll have closing comments from both our panelists now before I hand it over to uh, Jillian. Uh, Mr. Var Marivala, at the end of the day, you know, you've been on this journey of giving for some time. What are the lessons that you have learned? What is the advice you will give people who are listening to this and saying that, you know, maybe I could start? Because, you know, you don't need to be super very rich like you are to give. I think we can all give in our own way. And I know I'm doing it through, you know, through what we are doing at Live History India because I truly believe in it. And it's a, it's a struggle, but it's a wonderful journey. Um, so what would your advice be? So I think partly you answered my question that active giving is very important. And you need to give for a cause you are passionate about. Because if you are passionate about a cause, you will try that much extra. It is just not money. It is also what time are you giving? What ideas are you giving? How are you improving execution? So whether you're a corporate or an individual, to me, the most important thing is to find a cause which is for which there is a need and for which you are uh, you're passionate about. And if that combination happens with your active time and whatever resources you have, I think it'll lead to a higher degree of success. 
right? But of course, in my case, I think it is also important to make it so viable that it can live without you. You know, it can go beyond you. And I of think course, that perpetuity has to build in. You know, that can happen through that. that is, and for that viability and scale, I mean, I think the Amul model is not something that we spoke about, but that's a company I personally admire tremendously for the good they have done, the transformation they have brought about, and the wonderful work that they continue to do, even while being the market leader in all the segments that they are in. So you know, must mention that over here. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, I'll let you have the last word. What's the secret of giving and giving well and giving with impact? I said, giving with impact, start with the, the last part. I mean, I, I think uh, you really, you should weigh up how much you can change the lives of people long term and when, you, when you're deciding where to give, you know, and I, my mother used to say, you know, for every for every pound you give, you get ten back. <laughs> you know? And uh, I have found that, you know, it, it really is. You do the more you give, the more you get back. So it's not just a. It's not just a. a it's because it's the right thing to do. It's because it actually just makes you as um, uh, as Harris was saying. It, it actually makes you feel good. It makes you feel better about yourself. And when you see that you're actually making a difference, you know, and giving makes you feel better and you don't have to as you to your point you don't have to be wealthy to give and my mother wasn't wealthy but she was the president of the St Vincent de Paul and uh, she used to you know work very hard with the St Vincent de Paul the charity so you, you don't have to be wealthy to give you can improve people's lives by by, by working with them and mentoring them Right, absolutely. Be the change that you want to see. <laughs> Make the change happen. I think that's the one message. But wonderful to have you, Mr. Mariwala and Peter, to talk about uh, the art of giving, the joy of giving, and of course, the need for giving in a country like India, because I think uh, this concerted work that is being done by people like Mr. Mariwala, by uh, organizations and conglomerates like the Tatas, is really uh, something that needs to be highlighted more. We need more conversations around this because really there are templates that need to be followed, that can be followed to achieve great success. Many thanks for joining us and over to you, Julian. Thank you, Minnie. Thank, thank you that was that. such a wonderfully enriching conversation. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our audience for being here with us today and for participating by sending in your questions. This session was presented by Prime Securities. The books discussed during the session are available with our knowledge partner, landmarkxcite.com. Thank you to all our partners without whom none of this would have been possible. Tata Literature Live, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects, continues with many more sessions. Coming up right after this is what promises to be another very interesting conversation. Poe and Pau, an insider's view of two Catholic neighborhoods in Mumbai. Stay tuned. <laughs>